Well, hello. This is uh, Writing Wednesday on Tuesday, um, uh, here live from New York. Um, hope that some of you were able to make it. Um, it's my last day in New York, and uh, it's always such a thrill to be here. Uh, it just makes me feel, uh, cranks me up a little bit, makes me feel uh, more excited, more, uh, more inspired. Just getting uh, a new, any kind of new scenery is uh, always super helpful as a writer. And uh, New York is such a literary place and such an artistic place. And there's so much going on in such a small, compact space that it's, uh, it's just super exciting. So, uh, so glad that you could make it. And uh, I thought what we talk about today is the the care and feeding of artists. Um, I thought that, uh, but I thought I would first answer some of the questions that people had for me. Um, seeing that I'm uh, on Tuesday night because I'm flying tomorrow. Um, and uh, the first question that I had was somebody who is wor a Tina is working on a story where my main characters are inanimate objects. Uh, I was wondering how I can bring them to life without giving them human qualities, or is that unavoidable? Um, that's super interesting question. There is um, bringing them to life. Well, inanimate objects brought to life are going to have some sort of animate qualities. They're going to, if you're writing about them, they're going to have some sort of desires. They're going to have some sort of personality. Um, or they wouldn't be characters. They would just be uh, beds and tables and chairs. Um, so you don't want to give them human qualities, but you want to give them some sort of animate qualities. One of the best, most wonderful books about surprising characters is um, uh, a guy named, I think it's Stephen Werber. W-E-R-B-E-R, -E -E called um, The Empire of the Ants. And all of the characters are ants. And he's an entomologist, and he knows a great deal about ants. And he is able to write a whole book with ant uh, protagonists, three ants. Uh, and they are not at all human. They are ants with ant desires and ant needs and ant conflicts. Um, so they are very much animate, but you need to have some sort of uh, desire, some sort of conflict. Um, they need to, if they're animate, they have to have some characteristics of life. Um, so yes, I think you can do it, um, but you have to really think through, if it's an inanimate object, um, what sort of desire does a coat have? what sort of desire would a chair have uh, and work it through logically. Uh, I think it can be done. Uh, it will take a lot of originality, which is uh, not a bad thing in fiction. So I uh, uh, take, but check out Empire of the Ants. Uh, it will kill you. Uh, here's one, Wayne Klein. Hey, Wayne. Uh, what, are, what good ways could you suggest for a story writer to engineer audience rooting interest? So this is the question of, of how we care about uh, characters in your story. And there are two ways you quote-unquote root for a character, things you care about about a character. You can either sympathize with a character, find things in them that are similar to you, your aspirations, your um, uh, vulnerabilities, or they can be someone who you just find fascinating, that can be horrible, but you can't stop watching them, um, like Humbert Humbert in Lolita. We're sort of rooting for him, even though he's horrible. We don't want him to win. We don't want him to really win, but he's so interesting. You know, we are following him anyway. Uh, so either you make them people who are so original, you just want to see what they do next. Or they have some vulnerability, uh, something that 
you can that you've experienced yourself that makes you want to see them succeed. Um, here's another question. Um, let's see. Um, this is a good one about the care and feeding of writers. This is from Peggy. Um, how do you keep writing when the world is being dismantled? Hmm. Well, there are two approaches to this. There are probably more than two. But two approaches to this. One is you write about what's happening. Um, you write a political, uh, you write about politics. You write about um, what is actually happening now. Uh, or you write what you are intending to write anyway and trust <clears throat> that if you are expressing your concerns deeply enough, the what is hap you are living in time. Nobody can avoid living in time. Nobody can avoid living in history. And as you write about your own personal uh, situation, what your own personal con your own concerns, you will be embodying uh, your times, whether you choose to or not. Um, so I think that if you're living in soul crushing times, to allow some of that soul crushing into your work, um, it doesn't have to directly solve the problems. It could just be what you're hearing over the news as you're having the argument with your um, with your husband or wife or whatever uh, and the times start coming through you know this it's very hard to write about uh, things that have nothing to do with your own political moment so how do you keep your soul from being crushed another question um, I have started reading about Stoicism, never a philosophy that interested me when I was in school. It seemed uh, really boring and drab, and I was much more interested in, in uh, uh, other philosophies. But Stoicism is basically, I return to it when I have been so crazy lately that I couldn't get any work done at all. And uh, what I, it's, there's a piece on my website, if you want to take a look at it, uh, about my uh, becoming interested in Stoicism. And the basic tenet of Stoicism is uh, was that they felt that a, a person could only control themselves. The Romans lived in horrible times. People were horrible. Their politics were particularly horrible. Um, and they said that for a noble, you know, noble character, um, not necessarily rank, but no, noble person, um, that that which you have no control over should be a matter of indifference. Now that's a tough order, but it keeps you from getting caught up in bristling at what you have no control over. And then do whatever you can do for the things that you do have control over. You know, write those letters to your senators or, you know, send money to the ACLU, whatever it is that an action that you want to take. And then let it go. You've done your action. Try not to fret over the things you have no control over. And it takes, uh, it brings your energy back in into your body and allows that energy to be used for things that you want to use it. Because if you're just lying on your bed face down depressed, you're not helping anybody. You're just draining yourself. Um, so stoicism is definitely a worthwhile um, philosophy to look into. Um, then uh, let's see. So what I was talking about, thought I would talk about today is the care and feeding of, um, of the artist uh, inside. I think that so many people are focused so much 
on getting us getting the writing done that we don't stop to build the inner life of the writer um, not just journaling but really feeding uh, ourselves not just chewing on yourself you know which is a lot of what journaling is not I, I journal myself so I I can speak to that um, but how do you feed the artist inside well one of the things that um, I've noticed is people who tend to be producing work of the same caliber over and over and they don't seem to be getting any better and they're not taking because they're not taking on new information they are just trying to pull more out of themselves when nothing's going in and you know it's like um, mineral depletion you know you'll you'll suck the minerals right out of your own bones if you're not adding new material to your to your structure to yourself um, in during the Russian Revolution the poet Mayakovsky uh, got in a big argument with the uh, socialist realists um, because he <coughs> he championed the avant-garde in art which was thought of as elitist you know the average person doesn't want to read um, avant-garde poetry they don't get it they don't want it and so the powers that be said well let's just get rid of this because the average worker does not care about avant-garde art it's elitist not for them and Mayakovsky who was a vi who very much cared about the average person and giving them um, giving his poetry to them said that there is he argued to allow the avant-gardists to continue to publish that uh, he said there there is poetry for the consumer and there is poetry for the producer and he argued that the producer the poets needed the avant-garde poetry so that they could nourish themselves with this very new material and then process it in their own way so they had something to give the consumer the average poetry consumer who could have been a factory worker or whoever but without that extra nourishment of exposure to the new and strange and um, startling um, that isn't really all that uh, available to the average consumer of literature that this is how the producer reinforces himself or herself and that as writers as artists we have to look at what is going to nurture us so that we can process and have new material new nutrients new ideas new forms to uh, kind of pollinate what we already come with and I think that many people do not challenge themselves enough to read um, more avant-garde work you know that uh, you know once you've decided to be a writer you really owe it to yourself not to just read for pleasure anymore not to be a consumer you're no longer a consumer you are a producer and you owe it to yourself to pollinate with all kinds of weird things that you wouldn't necessarily have thought of yourself not just seek out the things that please you because actually you get the least ideas from the things that please you because you just enjoy them it's the odd flavor that you stop and you go hmm oh that's weird let's try that again hmm what do I think of that the thing that is not your natural pleasure zone is where you're gonna get the ideas from so read things you're not used to read things that you normally wouldn't read read something that seems really bizarre um, in the literary journals um, there's an incredible amount of interesting writing things that you probably wouldn't have thought of yourself things that 
maybe you would never have written yourself. Um, but ideas that will stimulate and feed your own process. Um, I, here in New York, I've seen plays that, uh, we, I saw, we saw two plays, both of which, I'm not a playwright, I'm not interested, you know, I'm not gonna be writing plays, um, but I got such ideas. There, I saw uh, Three Tall Women by uh, Edward Albee, and I saw um, a, a modern production of Yerma uh, by Lorca, and it had been transposed into modern life, and theme thematically was the same, but it was really innovative, uh, the way they staged it and the way they presented it. The first one, one of the things that I saw, uh, and you can read the Albee play uh, if you can't get to New York, which, you know, who can? I mean, many people do, of course, but, um, you know, I think of myself as a young writer, good luck, you know, I wasn't going to New York, I was a typesetter in Portland, Oregon, um, but I could definitely go to the library and read an Albee play, and this play, which seemed to be about aging, uh, in the second act um, of a two act, ended up having three, the same character played by three different women at three different ages, and they had a conversation together. And I thought, my God, what a great thing. You could use that all day long, having younger and older versions of your character talking to themselves. Um, talking to one another and the kind of things they would, what, what would they say? What would they, what would they argue? Would they, you know, would people be angry at each other? Would they even understand each other? Oh my God, ideas just pouring in. The Yerma, the uh, Lorca play, uh, I love the intensity of it, but there were like seven different acts and they use superscript, uh, these monitors that had the titles, chapter one, chapter two, and then they would frame them almost like a silent picture. But what if you were doing, say, seven scenes in a short story and you could have anything in those titles, what would you have? I mean, it's a way that you get ideas from other things and you frame them up into your art. Um, and getting some new ideas, getting some new oxygen in the water. I was just full of ideas after I'd seen both of them, uh, of things that I, short stories that I could see. I went to art exhibitions um, all week and I got such ideas of uh, things that I could write about. Um, I, Let's see if I can get my notebook out of uh, my suitcase. So you're going to see Andrew uh, sitting here writing. I'm going to walk over him. Um, but this is Writing Central, so this is what we do all the time. There's Andrew writing. Hi, Andrew. Um, let's see. Where's my notebook? There we go. So I've filled my notebook, and uh, now I'm uh, going to see some of the ideas that I was able to find. Um, the f so you're always looking for ideas. So I, um, uh, let's see, I had some, uh, I usually put a suitcase next to an idea in my notebook, which means unpack. You can unpack that idea. Um, I saw a dance, like a little dance concert in a gallery uh, at the Whitney. And I thought you could write a short story about two figures, two characters who are doing a dance in a metaphorical way. Um, and in that very stylized way. Um, there was one that was Zoe Leonard was a photographer. And one of the wonderful things she had was a photo album of period really period looking photographs that were facts that were false i mean she was invented it was an invented character but it 
with an actual biography with snapshots and like studio shots and I thought man you could make the most beautiful short story or short piece about a character with these photographs you could write that I could um, the the fabricated biography is fantastic um, I saw a uh, an erotic uh, photographic um, <clears throat> exhibition of uh, Araki, who was a Japanese photographer. Who there's this ele elegant art of tying women up and taking pictures of them. But I kept thinking, God, what are those women thinking? You know, that would be really interesting. You know what? Um, as a character, not something I'd ever think about, but seeing it opened my mind up to those ideas. Um, oh man, just ideas everywhere. Um, I, uh, oh, let me just see if I, but anyway, I got, I get ideas for stories everywhere I go. Um, I'm looking for the little the little uh, suitcases because those are always the the possibilities. Um, short stories about people living um, in advertising world. Um, I have a, a former student who I saw here who uh, works in the world of internet. Um, um, it's kind of self promotion. <clears throat> and a lot of work for writers. Um, but I was thinking how interesting it would do, be to write a story about somebody working in that world who's going to a party, and it turns out it's not a party, it's a photo op, and working in that world, you know, and trying to navigate the the separation between what is advertising and what is life. And it gets very blurry these days uh, if you're working in that world. Uh, I think that's, that'd be f fantastic uh, for stories. So you expose yourself to other people's ideas and you think, God, you know, how would I work with that idea? How would I work with that, you know, some bit of a play, some bit of, a, of an art exhibition? You're always looking to take in oxygen in the water, and it doesn't mean reading stuff that you like, because you just read it, and it's yummy, and yum, 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 and then there it goes. <clears throat> but really looking at things that are a little bit more uh, difficult to consume. In one of the great things in New York is a uh, library called Poetry House. Um, I just was there this afternoon. I always spend at least one afternoon there when I'm in New York. And Poetry House is a library, poetry library with 50,000 volumes of poetry and tables and, you know, comfy chairs and beautiful windows. So there's a great view, um, not necessary, but nice. But you take a poetry, like I take a journal, and I start reading the journal, literary journal. If you don't read the journals, there are a lot of ideas that you're not being exposed to. Um, so I take a journal, I start reading it. I have a student who uh, had a short story in Southern Review, who's just been chosen for Best American, Amy Silverberg, yay. And uh, so I read her story, but there were po poetry in there uh, poets I hadn't heard of, and there was one that I really liked, a guy named Stephen Gibson, I believe. So I went into the stacks, and I saw his poetry, uh, his books, and now I have a new poet that I really like. Um, so you can follow, uh, you can follow a train of interest. Uh, if somebody is good, don't just read one thing and go, okay, that was cool, I just ate those Doritos. But Remember that person, read some more of them, follow that. Um, 
and then looking at form. How do you um, how do you keep your uh, how do you keep your confidence? Um, is you keep ideas flowing when you feel alive when you feel like you're processing ideas um, your work will go well when you feel that you just don't have a fresh idea in your head that's when I want to I think oh maybe I should become you know a psychotherapist or preschool teacher or something else a uh, private investigator but when I feel like new ideas are coming in and I'm processing them then I never feel like quitting writing. I'm always excited to sit down and work. So um, that's Karen Feeding of the uh, of the writer. Keep your uh, just keep I new ideas flowing. Read things you normally wouldn't read. Things that are a little bit more avant garde than you would normally um, uh, produce yourself. And you get ideas that you would never have before. Uh, this sounds like a lot of work. I'm too lazy for all that. Well, that's, you know, th there's no harm in being a reader. Reader, Being a reader is one of the great pleasures of life. Um, but most of the people here are uh, looking to be writers. Um, and uh, it's hard to, when you're not in school, which, you know, I didn't do a writing program, uh, I was just looking to get bits and pieces uh, wherever I could find them. So I was hoping that, <coughs> you know, just to get somebody would tell me something that would feed my process. And uh, so I feel like I need to continue to uh, uh, continue pass that along. So poetry, music, dance, art, the other arts, and then just walking around, boy, walking around New York, you see things, you see people, you think, God, what about that person, you know? Where are they coming from? What what were they thinking? Where did they just come from? Um, so curiosity has a lot to do with it. And if you are, uh, when you lose your curiosity, you're also losing some of your spark. So some of it is, is how do you, if you notice that you're no longer curious about people, that's when you need to um, find a way to, to to spark that curiosity again. Uh, one of the things that I've um, my mom used to do when I was a little kid is we go out, we go somewhere and have uh, maybe have a hamburger afterwards, or we'd stand in line at the bank, and she'd point somebody out. She'd say, "Tell me about that person." You know, where do they live? What do they do for a living? What's their name? Are they married? Do they have kids? What do their house look like? You know, what's in their kitchen? What's And uh, that's something that really can uh, restore your curiosity about life, is to look at people and start creating a character from that guy sitting across from you in the, in the uh, subway. The hardest thing is to stay home in a room by yourself and try to come up with this stuff day after day after day. You do drain yourself, so you do have to get out and and interact with uh, con outside reality. So um, anyway, that's uh, tonight's uh, writing Wednesday or on Tuesday. Tomorrow, fly back to LA, back to editing the uh, the second book of Marina's story. So uh, if you haven't read it yet, in the first volume, you know, hopefully you'll enjoy it. And uh, the new one's on its way. Okay, so you take it easy and uh, see you next week. Bye.